Good morning and welcome to the FMCC webinar, Emergency Planning, Risk Management, and Business Continuity, a program of up-to-date knowledge for SM leaders presented by Stephen Brown, CFM, SFP, SMP of SM Advisor Inc. Next slide. Everyone has been muted for audio quality and this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box on your control panel and we will go over them during the Q&A portion at the end. Next slide. My laptop seems to be locked up. The FMCC provides many services to the FM community, such as Ask the Expert, Find a Consultant, Locate a Speaker, and online educational resources. You may find more information at their website, fmcc.ifma.org. Next slide. When you exit the webinar box, you will be asked to take a survey. I encourage you to take the survey as the FMCC board does look at the feedback. As I mentioned in the opening, Stephen Brown is the presenter who is managing, who is the managing director of FM Adviso Inc. and brings 25 years of managing the built environment for both private and public sector organizations. Brown funded the FM Adviso Inc to provide specialist facility management credentials and knowledge training, to also provide specialist consulting on operational and staff efficiencies, environmental matters, risk and business continuity management, outsourcing policies and procedures for SM. Okay, I will be now handing the presentation over to Mr. Brown. I will begin by telling you, um, offering a good morning to everyone based on the time zone that I'm sitting. I want to welcome you to the webinar, an overview of emergency planning, risk management, and business continuity. As was introduced, I'm Stephen Brown, and FM Adviso is an FM-focused international consulting and training business. The majority of FM Adviso activities are in the Middle East and in the Caribbean. FM Adviso is also a partner in the Global Facility Management Alliance to serve larger clients and for more complex multidisciplinary projects. I do have a lengthy background in facility management and have earned a number of the relevant credentials. I'm active and qualified to teach credential and certification programs for IFMA, Disaster Recovery Institute, and for the Association of Facilities Engineering. Before I advance the slides, I want to reiterate that this webinar is an overview that will increase your awareness. Just as you would not expect to learn facility management or another career specialty in a short educational program, the field of emergency preparedness risk management and business continuity management involves complex programs that require a good deal of focus. The objective of this webinar is to make you more aware, more knowledgeable, and to capture your curiosity to learn more about this exciting and diverse aspect of facility management. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. As we progress, you can type these into the chat box on your displayed control panel, and those will be received by the facilitator organizer. So let's start with a question. Why should you be here? As facility managers, you have a responsibility to support not only the bricks and mortar, the buildings, but there are also direct and indirect responsibilities for the facility operations and the support of the business operations. 
when problems occur, the FM, the facility manager, is involved and very often is held accountable for response and recovery. There have been a number of studies by insurance companies and related businesses that rate the risk for insurance and investment purposes. And there's a chilling statistic that indicates 38% of businesses that encounter a catastrophic event simply do not reopen. This is immediate and permanent effect. It's shocking, but some do reopen. Of those that do reopen, the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency reports that 25% of them fail within one year. And the Small Business Association reports that up to 90% of these businesses will close within two years. It's significant. The interruption of the catastrophe disrupts or halts the customer base. We know that loyalty is not so common as it once was. If your company makes a product, the customers are simply not likely to wait for you to resume, but they will find an alternate and most may not return, assuming that you do reopen. An interruption to your suppliers causes them to make alternate plans and arrangements. You have to consider they have to make their sales and deliveries for them to stay in business. And your employees are subject to the heavy emotional burdens and significant life changes. If their paycheck is interrupted, their livelihood is threatened. Many of these folks are forced into change, and again, most of them will not make a second change to return if your business does recover. So, sorry to start with the depressing news, but let's speak about how we can prepare, how we can make the business more resilient, and how to minimize the impact of incidents. Emergency planning is focused on how you identify the threats and organize and plan for first response actions that can reduce the effects. This straightforward approach is to identify the risks and to prepare a matrix of hazards. This can allow you for the best decision on how to apply your resources and your efforts. You want to consider what could happen then consider the likelihood and the outcomes, whether it's a remote occurrence like a meteor falling from the sky or almost certain, like a power outage. Then we look at the consequences. You know, apply values to assess the level of importance. In this, this initial phase, you've identified some of the big risks, you've prioritized, and you've set a stage for your plan to respond as compared to the inefficient and less effective reaction to an incident. This first review and creation of a threat matrix provides you with a basis for an action plan. You want to consider the threats, the hazards, the areas where the business is vulnerable. You also want to consider if an incident occurs, who is going to be in charge? Who will act? When will these actions occur? Where will the persons report for duty? What will they know or how will they know what to do? And so on. Consider a worst case that you have no one to call on for assistance. Even if you call a fire brigade, it's going to take time for them to mobilize and arrive. Precious minutes should not be lost. On the other hand, if we're referring to a regional weather disaster, you may not have any aid available for days. A hurricane, for example, can leave you completely self-reliant for 72 to 96 hours. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security's FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, has created NIMS, National Incident Management System. You can Google and find this, and this can be a valuable guide for your planning. You also 
are encouraged to review with your emergency responders. In the first instance, they're very happy to see your site and understand where hazards exist, the best way to enter the facility, etc. But they're also very happy to give advice and help you plan for their response and how the FM team can assist. It is your awareness and knowledge as an excellent first step. But consider what happens when we walk and we don't take that second step. Yes, we fall flat on our faces. So unless you're on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you need to ensure that your team is prepared to step in. Document the information and review it with your team to identify the action plans and how they will participate. Determine who it is that will carry out uh, the responsible assignments and communicate, share this information, conduct reviews and drills and exercises. Make it as automatic as what it can be. These first slides have covered some aspects of emergency planning. These steps of emergency planning displayed on the left relate to two of the five facets of risk management. Identifying the threat and analyzing and we've even discussed starting the third, that is, action. Risk management expands action toward mitigating threats and planning alternative schemes and extends with the facets of monitoring and control, the features of management and quality assurance. The business continuity cycle that's displayed on the right expands the risk review into broader business operations, certainly for the facility management, but more so for the business. Reviewing key and critical threats. Analyzing to determine when it becomes a threat. Details of how the business is impacted and what options exist to mitigate, how you can minimize, what you can do to recover faster. And again, testing, training, and maintaining. Your facilities are not static, so these periodic reviews and drills are absolutely necessary. In short, risk management focuses on and anticipates the causes and the risks. Threat identification and then deciding what options to mitigate. Where business continuity is dealing with the effects if the risks are realized, if the incident occurs, what are the implications? Planning and preparation are the best options for response and recovery. Disaster Recovery Institute is one of, if not the globally recognized leader in programs that effectively manage risk management and business continuity activities. Um, similar to the question I get sometimes from folks when they want to know, should I talk to IFMA or should I reflect IFMA when I'm talking about project management or is PMI better? For DRI, it's a similar answer that IFMA, when you're doing an FMP training or following the IFMA guidelines, IFMA tells you why you need to do this, where DRI focuses on how to do it. The 11 key categories that are identified in front of you show the aspects of professional practices that are involved in setting up a business continuity plan. This slide is displaying the DRI definition of business continuity where business continuity management is an holistic management process that identifies potential threats to an organization and the impacts to business operations that those threats, if realized, might cause, and which fr provides a framework for building organizational resilience with the capability of an effective response that safeguards the interests of its key stakeholders, reputation, brand and value creating activities. Boring that I read it to you, but I want to call out four key phrases. 
Number one, it's a management process. Number two, it's identifying those potential threats and the impact to the business. The third is that it provides a framework for building resilience. And the fourth, it's safeguarding the interests of those key stakeholders. When you consider the question, what is business continuity, facility managers are often intimately aware of their responsibilities for their facilities, the bricks and mortar. This includes the threats of fire, explosion, flood, utility interruption, environmental releases, even domestic violence. But when we think of that DRI definition, the holistic considerations, we also must think of technology, the threats of disruption to our networks, hardware failures, virus, trojan, ransomware, even the power quality problems. Business operations are another key component where we want to review our supply chain, consider the impacts of a labor strike, product liability, pandemic, transit strike, and also organizational factors, executives and leadership, and the succession plan that exists for the organization, intellectual property, even audit issues and financial problems. When you take in the full perspective of DRI's holistic management process, you can recognize the need to consider each of these broader impacts and how they can have an adverse effect for the organization. Facility management has key responsibilities. This reinforces that the facility manager needs to be a leader to prepare, to promote, and to protect the activities that assess the threats, mitigate potential issues, being on guard, being a champion to test and fully prepare the organization, and ultimately, if an incident occurs, to respond effectively. The goal of business continuity management is to support the organization's viability and mission. In the first instance, you want to assure personal safety of the occupants. Being ready to respond effectively, again, not reacting, responding, and make well-considered decisions. Expanding the capacity to respond, not just your preparedness, but the entire team and the other departments within the organization, and ultimately to minimize the loss to the organization. Complete consideration of these components proves that the organization is prepared to protect the varied interests of all the stakeholders. So you're thinking, okay, this is worthwhile, but why is it so important to the facility manager? Well, there are other factors that substantiate the importance. Some organizations in the United States, financial institutions are regulated. It's a requirement that planning is mandated and provided to protect the institution. The programs can also be a part of due diligence and professional facility management, again relating to shareholder accountability. It aids with the recovery of critical functions that minimize the loss to the customers, number one, protecting the clients and the employees. And it protects the brand, the image of the organization. In this era of instant awareness with social media like Facebook and Twitter, a proactive response can quickly reduce negative publicity that can arise. I doubt that I'm making it sound like a piece of cake, uh, business continuity activities are not easy. In fact, it's very difficult because we're often dealing with people in emotional situations. Human nature can cause embellished reporting, the exaggeration of facts. For example, a small fire in a rubbish bin can quickly be reported as a building burning down, 
by a person who is excitable or prone to desire attention. The facility manager has to sift through the message and identify the facts on which good decisions can be made. It's very important that you keep in mind that this mental state will cause persons to consider their needs first before they consider the needs of the organization. Considering a regional disaster like a flood or an earthquake, you must always bear in mind that people will respond to their personal needs, protecting their family, etc., before they begin to think about their jobs and the business needs. It's vital that there are sufficient drills and tests that make responses automatic and also to ensure that there's a depth of awareness so that multiple persons can respond and contribute. The ideal circumstance is for all relevant persons to understand each of the response roles. I'm aware of one high-risk business enterprise that involves the full range of their employees in awareness and training. As an example, if an incident occurs during overnight hours, the janitor understands what are the initial steps to be taken and he is empowered to act. He remains on duty and responsible until a more responsible person arrives. Let's use an example of security and then relinquishes control to them. Security remains the lead until another, more responsible person, like a manager. This scheme repeats until the defined incident commander arrives. Each party remains on hand to assist and to debrief information on the event about the observations and the responses. We've all heard the phrase, time is of the essence, and this is especially true during catastrophic events. The response planning is purely focused on limiting the disruption or the impact to the least possible time, and this corresponds to the least financial impact and the least impact to customers and occupants. This display is the anatomy of a catastrophic event. The y-axis indicates the severity, the x-axis references the duration as you view it from left to right. Note the three phases of disaster response in red, the crisis or incident management in yellow, and then business continuity in green, and how they overlap. Let's walk through an illustration. The lightning bolt symbol at the lower left indicates an occurrence. Let's consider this event as a fire. The red arc is the disaster response. The first responders are on the way. The fire department arrives. The amber arc section of this, excuse me, the, yes, the amber arc section of crisis management is within your organization. The orange section overlapping the red is indicative of the facility management responsibilities working with the first responders for evacuation, securing the site, even shutting down utilities for the fire brigade and similar actions. The amber section also relates to a myriad of other organizational responsibilities. A few examples include human resources to notify employees and families, the communications department to make news releases, marketing to advise their customers, production to advise suppliers and make alternate arrangements, finance to contact insurance carriers, executives to communicate to stakeholders, and facility management has a role to start the cleanup. The green arc section is business continuity and the diverse organizational activities therein. The light green segment displays that a well-prepared organization initiates quick actions toward the recovery. The facility management unit has involvements to identify and secure alternate for site requirements, finance organizing emergency expenditures and procurement organizing contracts for restoration or construction, and production to set up alternate resources so that they can resume their outputs. These activities continue 
until the organization is back to normal or pre-event conditions. This slide is displaying the broad character characterization range of the threats and the origins that can deliver catastrophic consequences to the organization. I'm not going to read them, but I'm going to suggest that you consider your facilities, your business organization, as well as the broader environment around you. As an example of this broader environment, I will mention a florist supply business in a Midwestern U.S. city. This business had reviewed their risks and cataloged and had a pretty good business continuity plan, except that they did not consider, consider that there was a compressed gas business just across the alley and about 80 meters from their property. The first instance that they realized this risk, there was an ammonia gas leak that forced an evacuation for six hours. Unfortunately, they did not update their business continuity plan. And some months later, there was a vehicle accident that resulted in a huge fire when welding gas cylinders were ignited. All buildings in the area were evacuated for almost 36 hours. This fire occurred on the 11th of February, three days before Valentine's Day. The result? The florist business lost 20% of their annual sales. They had a massive loss of uninsured inventory, a devastating loss of business reputation from customers who had ordered flowers for their sweethearts. And today this business is still active, but it is no longer the industry leader that it once was. This previous example referenced some of the areas that the florist business was affected. But as you consider your organization, remember this slide displaying categories that can be impaired in your business. Always remember, business continuity planning is very broad. When we start to evaluate how we address the risks, it's important to appreciate that there are controls in different forms. Physical protection, as in the displayed fire sprinkler, is a physical control that can reduce the extent of the loss in case of fire. Logical protection is another concept. An example is placing guardrails to prevent persons from falling from a higher elevation. The location of assets is the idea that you prevent unauthorized access and includes securing equipment in a locked room or even the use of passwords that limit access to your data. Changes to personnel procedures can be represented by the guidelines and the policies that protect untrained persons from entering a hazardous area or attempting program changes in the building automation. Increased preventive maintenance increases the reliability of the building systems, making your facility more robust and resilient against operational interruptions. Management of utilities ensures dependability for the facility operations. Again, making the site more robust and avoiding disruptive outages. The interface with agencies outside your organization reduces the potential for interruptions or disruptions. Good communications keeps you aware of the potential impacts so you can plan accordingly. Facility managers tend to focus on certain facility risks like fire and utility but there are many other risks that can disrupt our businesses. Again, I'm not going to read through this extensive list, but I'll allow you a few min minutes to read through, and as you peruse this list, know that it is not exhaustive, and certainly it does not pertain to all organizations. Your site may have more threats or fewer. This list is simply offered to get your mind working toward the focus and the risks that exist are not just those under your roof. 
I use this opportunity to remind you of the example of the florist and how a nearby business caused them irreversible corporate damage. Make certain that you review the area around your business for potential threats. Once you've identified those threats that pertain to your site and they're displayed here as a sample list, the next step is to consider your mitigation options. For this sample list, here are some examples that be can, can be considered. As you can see, some of them are not expensive. Anchoring equipment and file cabinets to prevent overturn in an earthquake is an example. Remember, it's not building collapse, but it's falling objects inside a space that are one of the top causes of injuries in earthquakes. One of the top five falling objects in these earthquakes in an office setting are troffer light fixtures that shake loose from suspended grid ceilings. The point I'm making is be vigilant, look in detail, and think outside the box as you're looking at these risks. A key activity in business continuity planning process requires analysis of the processes that are undertaken by the business. The questions to be raised that what are the functions that if disruptive will have a significant impact to the business? What is truly critical? How can these functions be made more resilient? And how can other business functions be protected? For each business activity or process, you want to analyze the impacts. This is called the Business Impact Analysis, or a BIA. In the previous slide, we spoke of criticality. Now we want to include and consider time sensitivity. By example, a 10-minute power outage may be accepted as a risk, but at what point does that power outage become too much for the business to abide? 30 minutes? One hour? Two hours? What are the interdependencies? Look, again, look at the details. As an example, your IT department may have a UPS backup for network power, but that does not usually maintain the cooling. If a one-hour power outage in the data center requires a shutdown to prevent overheating, now you're going to impact customer order entry that may even be in a different site. We want to define the losses and impacts over time. Make them measurable. Qualify and quantify what is required to restore the required functionality. What is the minimum functionality that is acceptable to the organization and at what point in time is this required? If your network is not available, what records must be available? Paper records that can permit manual functionality, like an order entry. In the previous slide, there was a question about the minimum required functionality and the associated time implications. These recovery goals are viewed from two measures. The first is the recovery time objective. How long is too long before you restore? The second is the recovery point objective. What is the maximum loss that the business can abide? Once the recovery time objective is identified, then you're able to decide if your incident is a simple disruption or a disaster. It's the time and impact and cost that must be reviewed and take the decisions. Whether it's a disruption or a disaster, both constitute a crisis for your organization. For the best outcomes, again, focus how to respond, avoid reactive. With that last assertion, I want to start to summarize some of the points we've covered. 
As a quick review, we've characterized some of the distinctions between the terms. Emergency preparedness is your action plan. How you will make an initial and planned response to an incident rather than reacting like your hair is on fire. Risk management is the activity to anticipate the risks and business continuity relates to how you deal with the effects or the aftermath and how you minimize operational damage. Emergency preparedness is preemptive and it also is to anticipate the needs if a catastrophic event is occurring. Risk management is proactive just in case or if the event occurs and business continuity guides you on how to respond when the incident occurs and should generally include support for the entire organization. And your aim is to start making a business continuity plan. You want to delve into the possible scenarios, question, explore the events that could occur, systematically document your data, Review the summary information with your business leadership. Engage with them. Make sure you have their understanding and their support, and you will find you're going to be empowered to act, and the resources will be made available. Make the program. Make an action list, and then take action. Take on the activities in sequence. It's all about the details if you were to achieve the greatest success. Yes, the goal is to help the business function, but the business continuity plan must recognize the impact to the occupants, where they function, what business tools they employ, how they interact with other occupants, and of course meeting their personal needs. Some final observations, whether it's in your job description or not, many organizations assume that the facility manager is the person who will be in charge during the catastrophe. You want to keep this in mind and plan accordingly. I will share my observation that facility managers who have planned for emergency preparedness, risk management, and business continuity, and who then face an incident, perform well, and they were appropriately recognized for their performance. As noted at the onset of this webinar, this has been an overview. There are a myriad of other details to be considered and included in a proper program that protects the facility and the business interests. Statistically speaking, you will not experience a catastrophic incident. With that said, I will share with you that in my 25 years of facility management, I have been involved in FM and experienced a partial building collapse due to extreme snowfall, disastrous building flooding that was caused by a broken 14-inch water main, a four-day community-wide water outage in Saudi Arabia, contractor fatalities, and more. Now, maybe I was unlucky, but on the other hand, every day you work in facility management, you increase the odds that an incident will occur. Take initiative. Be prepared to take that leadership role. More information and Planning for emergencies, risk, and business continuity will be available in an instructional webinar that is offered by FM Advizo and Global Facility Management Alliance. We also offer related consults as well as the Disaster Recovery Institute knowledge and credential training programs. I'm very happy to entertain any questions you might have. Enter them into the chat box, or if I don't have an answer now, I will certainly secure it and revert. Let's see, I see there are a couple of questions here.
say that the corporate suite is uninitiated about emergency preparedness, risk management, and business continuity. Aside from an actual incident or near miss, can you suggest triggers that an FM can use to obtain top executive attention and develop a committed C-suite champion? The first answer I will give you on that is to be aware of other inst instances that affect other businesses and then try to bring home the pain, bring home the topic so that when a competing organization or a similar organization experiences flooding like is going on in the Houston, Texas area yesterday or earthquakes as is going on in Italy, you know, remind them that these are items out of control and show them what devastating effects. It's, it always is more appreciated by the C-suite when they see the impacts, when they see businesses that don't recover with those statistics that I shared at the onset. Another question that came in, where can I find examples of business continuity programs, for example, evacuation action plan? Well, there are a number of them available on subscription, but I need to do some research and see if there's something available outside of a subscription. Um, on a subsequent slide, I'm going to be providing you my contact information. If the party who asked that question will drop me an email, I will follow up. Third question. In your matrix, I presume the numbers are the products of the two axis category. Did you ever consider the 139 numbers like the house of quality? have and my goal is to make it as simple and easy to follow as possible. Um, it doesn't make a bit of difference what numbers you use as long as you can identify those lower risk, medium risk, and high risk. Use A, B, C, one, two, three, it doesn't make any difference as long as you can justify the rating and help guide your desire to deal with the high-risk items first. I don't see any other questions that have come in. Again, I've, as I mentioned to that one individual, here is the contact information for FM Adviso. My email is slb at fm-adviso.com. I also list my website. And the Global Facility Management Alliance website is also displayed. Sidi, would you like to fill in the last slides here? Yes. The FMCC would like to bring awareness to other councils and communities, which are below. Next slide. Thank you again for joining us for the FMCC Emergency Planning, Risk Management, and Business Continuum, a program of up-to-date knowledge for FM leaders presented by Stephen Brown. Thank you, Stephen, for a great presentation. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day. I offer my sincere thanks and encourage everybody be well. Thank you.